Welcome to the Social Business Engine Podcast, where today's thought leaders discuss how they're using the latest social media strategies and technologies in marketing, sales, customer service, and HR. Get ready to be inspired as our guests contribute to your digital transformation through their stories, knowledge, and insights into what works in today's digitally connected world. And now, here's Bernie Borges, your host of the Social Business Engine Podcast. Hey there, welcome to episode 203. I'm Bernie Borges, CMO of Ingresso, and your host of the Social Business Engine Podcast. Hey, as always, thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. In this episode, I'm excited to bring you my conversation with Jason Schober, Social Media Campaign Manager at U.S. Bank. I think it's the first time I've had a bank on my podcast. So on this episode, you're going to hear from Jason on how U.S. Bank enables its relationship managers, which are really sales functions in the bank, they call them relationship managers, to leverage social on how to engage in conversations and identify ways to service clients with a relationship-first mindset. And before we get to my conversation with Jason Schober, I want to let you know that this episode is sponsored by SAP. Social Business Journal Volume 11 is a case study in savvy social selling the SAP way. You're going to learn, if you didn't catch the podcast series, even if you did, download the journal because you're going to learn how SAP sales reps have deals. They create deals that are 560% larger on average when they use social selling techniques. Now, the case study is available for download without a form to fill out. In other words, it's ungated. When you click on it, it just opens right up in your browser. You can get it at vengresso.com forward slash SAP. And of course, we're going to link that up in our show notes page at vengresso.com. All right, let's get to my conversation with Jason Schober from US Bank. Jason, welcome to the Social Business Engine podcast. Thanks, Bernie. Happy to be here. Fantastic. Well, you and I met at Social Media Marketing World in beautiful San Diego, California, and talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, here you are a bank and you are in the world of enterprise social sales. So I wanted to invite you on to share that experience with my listening audience here. So Jason, why don't we begin with just an introduction to you and your role at U.S. Bank? Yeah, thanks. So I have been with U.S. Bank for the past two and a half years, previously coming from HC World, where not only worked with LinkedIn as a primary content and workflow, but also as a client. And so I lived and breathed LinkedIn and the social sales life there. And as well as then working at previous agencies to that, was doing a lot of education programs for the FinServe communities on how to use social media as part of their firms and businesses. And so that was something that not originally part of my role when I was hired at the bank, but it is something that they've come to utilize and have allowed me to create some really great programs around. So I have been in charge of leading our social sales program here for the past almost two years now. Along with that, I do work with a lot of our B2B business lines on their marketing campaigns and advertising execution. So it allows me a unique position to both live in the sales and marketing worlds for our B2B business lines. So I advocate a lot of what you advocate for is this sales and marketing alignment. And I think I'm in a a really great place to help our business lines, specifically on the B2B side, help execute that. Fantastic. Well, we're already singing the same sheet of music as the cliche goes. So can you elaborate a little bit, Jason, on what you mean by B2B business lines? Because I know I'm not all that familiar with the banking industry and I would imagine others, you know, may also not have that much familiarity with what does it mean to have B2B business lines at US Bank? Yeah. So it runs really a full gambit. It can be our business banking, community banking groups that work out of branches or regional offices that work with all of our small business owners, maybe even some middle, mid-sized organizations as well. And so we've definitely discussed with them around some of these best practices within B2B kind of structure there, especially when it talks about more of that community setting in small business. But then it can go up to working with middle market and even large market enterprise organizations. And so that can be something in our commercial banking, commercial real estate, investment services for organizations like trusts and custody. 
And so things of that nature, you know, as we start to see those organizations increase in size, we see the complexity of those relationships increase as well. And so we have a a large portfolio of products and services and groups that, you know, they have their own structure of services that they can provide. But the more complicated organization, the more arms, larger size, we start to see those organizations and business lines start to work together a lot more often. And so that's where we like to utilize social sales to help understand where those relationships lie from a social networking standpoint, as well as, you know, internal CRM piece as well. But then we can keep it kind of informal, professional, which is may seem like an oxymoron, but I think that's where we can see social play a lot more of a natural networking type of scenario where a referral from one of our colleagues in one business line to the other plays really, really well to making those connections and why we encourage our salespeople to connect with their clients. So the business lines can run full gamut from all way from small business to large enterprise. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, when you say your salespeople, again, in the banking industry, in the commercial or the B2B line of the banking industry, that's not a very clear picture. So Mm -hmm. what is a salesperson? What are some of the roles or maybe titles before we kind of get into, you know, your social selling best practices, which I know we're going to talk about. Maybe you can kind of paint that picture for my listener on, you know, what is a salesperson at U.S. Bank? Yeah, I think, you know, it does vary from business line to business line. But what we see from maybe our larger groups, organizations that have middle market to large market clients, you may see something more along the lines of relationship managers where they are positioning themselves as a true partner, as an advocate for our clients and trying to find, you know, how we can be the best trusted choice for that organization when it comes to their financial needs. And so relationship managers will play a key role for client facing. Uh, A lot of those organizations then from a structure will also have some sort of sales support. And that can be, you know, relation to any kind of movement that they need to make for the portfolio products, or it can be from a keeping the pipeline active and moving while the relationship manager works on more of those complex relationships, maybe face-to-face or kind of the process that need to happen there. So we see that quite often as a structure, and those are the types of salespeople that we'd have in those organizations. And then something that's maybe a little bit on the lower side, we have our business bankers, our community bankers, and then sole business development officers that may be helping more of our small businesses, small franchises, that sort of thing that have maybe just a few multiple city-wide or region-wide parts of their organization. And so those might be a little bit more of kind of the expansive, you know, traditional sales where you see you're handling all of your pipeline development as well as working through that funnel. And then maybe they have, you know, support that helps onboard those new clients or help purchase any kind of new services or offerings that they might need. Okay, cool. So Jason, the social sales program, is that a program that you've launched at US Bank? It is. Uh, We had originally set up when I was brought in two and a half years ago, we had some basic social media training. And the caveat there is when our social media team was brought in and developed, it wasn't just part of you know marketing. It was actually, we are part of the brand team at US Bank. And that is in very, very intentional because one, we have an understanding of what it means to be on brand across multiple business lines so we can help disseminate that message and also then have a piece of compliance as part of our role so that we can help enforce that. So you I was know, going to ask you about that because, you know, Early, it's well known that you're in the financial services industry and there's all kinds of compliance issues. So I was going to ask, yeah. what role does that play in your social sales program? Absolutely. And I think that was one of the big triggers of even developing the social media team is because we understood from an audit that there were a lot of business lines that were just trying to execute it on their own with no consistency up to the brand message and understand kind of what that larger theme is that we want from business line to business line. And so by having that, having us position where we are, we're able to have that consistent voice to each business line, help them execute that appropriately, but still have their own kind of personality and nuances that is important to how they do business. We would just make sure that we can come from the compliance side as well as the brand side to help them understand how to execute that into market. Yeah. And just, I just want to comment for my listener that what you're describing is not unique to, you know, your 
company at U.S. Bank in your industry, the financial services industry. Every company that has multiple product lines or business lines needs some level of that consistent voice. Mm-hmm. So the fact that you know you play that role within not just the social media team, but the brand team is very wise and really pleased to see that that's part of the planning and part of the strategy. So touche. That's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So let's get into your best practices. I know that you wanted to talk about, you know, what you've been doing to establish best practices for the different sales teams. Yeah. So this is something that we really wanted to help address as well as because it is myself leading and I do get some support from additional team members every once in a while. And what I also try to do is have a key contact with each business line that helps from kind of their internal point of view. And what I've been able to establish as far as best practices is really building out a training that allows for proper onboarding and to make sure that we're not just simply giving them best practices and asking them to execute without any type of support. And so what we've been able to do is develop a good training session that not only helps us from a compliance standpoint, which is kind of our profile and best practices on networking type of training, but we also go in depth around how to use LinkedIn for prospecting, how to identify triggers that allow you to initiate conversations even if it isn't on social, this is one of the things we, we try to emphasize as well is that not all your clients and prospects are going to be social first in their communication. Right. And so helping them understand that you can still use social to identify some triggers and talking points so that when you do outreach, whether it is your traditional email or phone call, you have that context helps eliminate the just checking in types of touch points. And so we find that to be those types of things in the training are very consistent from business line to business line. And so those are the best practices we like to emphasize. I had mentioned the nuances of our business lines and how they structure their sales teams and how then potentially their different roles within that sales environment may differ. So that's where we try to you know, build out maybe a little bit of a 20% customization. Now, here's how you as an RM should be thinking about interacting with your clients. You're fostering those relationships. You're helping them understand the services and offerings that you can potentially have. You're still establishing yourself as a thought leader and a professional that they want to do business with by staying top of mind, providing them some value, whether it is content or outreach or uh, maybe introductions to other business owners within your market. And I think that's a key thing is, especially from the banking industry, is being part of the community. So even if you are in a B2B setting, we do have the way that we structure most of our groups. Each individual is operating in a local geographic area. Is that right? Exactly. We want them to feel, and this is one of our core values, just feel part of that community that we're drawing strength, uh, powering potential within our communities. And we really want them to feel like that they can be part of that community, not only from, you know, how they interact in person, but then continuing to network with those, you know, centers of influence within their community on a regular basis. So that's where we start to then talk a little bit more. What are the nuances for your community? What are the nuances for your outreach? And how do we then create the most trusted choice as a partner and what that next best action might be with those individuals? So the RMs are maybe focusing on clients where sales support or your business development officers are thinking more, okay, how do I keep that pipeline full? And how do I start to establish that rapport in those relationships potentially through social media. Okay, fantastic. And then I know that you talk a lot about culture. So, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe you've already been sort of alluding to that. Yeah. Maybe you can elaborate on the importance of culture in your social sales program. Yeah. So a big theme that we've been really hitting on this past year is those two things I'd mentioned, being a most trusted choice with our clients and our partners, and also identifying what those next best actions are. So along with how we're establishing our sales process within social media, we're doing a lot more. And one of the things that we're doing, our chief information officer was recently keynote at Dreamforce and talking about how we've started to implement AI and Einstein as part of our uh, kind of data mining and being able to take what we understand from our clients trends, relationships, how they're utilizing our products, maybe money movement to better understand what are some solutions that we can provide 
or support that we can provide for our clients to make that next best action. So having something like that in place not only can help inform us from, in my role as a social media marketer, how we're going to maybe present certain products and services to our market, but then it can also help inform our sales teams on knowing our customer, building that relationship first mentality versus product first mentality where we may go in with, here's our portfolio of products. But now we can say, based on how you've been utilizing our services, we really feel we can help you in this way. That's how, again, we establish that most trusted choice, that next best action as part of that sales process. And then the sales process as far as social comes into play is, and this is where I like to stroke the ego, a lot of that stuff with AI and marketing automation and social marketing has to do behind the scenes where I like to stroke the ego of the salespeople and say, well, here's how you can take ownership. The social sales process is a way for you to take ownership of that next best action. You can help identify what that next best action might be based on social triggers. You can have those touch points that allow you to understand your customer more and more and more, build that rapport, and so that you feel comfortable approaching them with what you feel can be the best way to partner with them, whether it is, again, I mentioned maybe consolidating some products and services to make it a much better and stronger relationship, or maybe there is a gap that that we can help identify based on their research or based on some of the triggers that are being sent through marketing to be able to have those conversations with our customers. Okay, excellent. So Jason, I want to take a brief pause for a message from our sponsor. When we come back, I want to talk about how you keep the sales teams engaged so that they can execute on their social sales plan very consistently. So let's pause here for a brief message from our sponsor. SAP has trained 12,000 sales reps across the globe in social selling strategies. SAP sales reps are skilled at identifying buying signals in social media, engaging prospects in sales conversations, differentiating themselves from competition, and leveraging a technology-driven sales process. The result is sales reps at SAP who use social selling practices have more than five times bigger deals on average than those who don't. To learn how SAP has implemented and maintains their global social selling program and what's next on this, get the case study in Social Business Journal Volume 11. It's available for download without a form to fill out at vengresso.com forward slash SAP. That's Savvy Social Selling, the SAP way, available for download, ungated at vengresso.com forward slash SAP. So Jason, let's talk about how you keep your sales team engaged so that they're executing on the social sales plan in a consistent manner. Yeah. So we do a couple things right now. And I think there's definitely areas that we can improve. And that's something that I continue to work on as we bring and onboard more and more of our sales professionals. But we do a couple things right now where We are holding uh, town halls uh, along with our LinkedIn reps, other sales leaders to help, and then any kind of what I like to call super users of LinkedIn, where I can understand, okay, these people are doing it on a consistent basis. I'm getting feedback from them that they're executing. These are people internal to your US bank? Is that what you mean by super users of LinkedIn? Yes, exactly. Yep. And so, and I may bring in every once in a while a sales leader from outside the bank, but I like to have a good kind of message and just kind of thought leadership around different tactics that they can help understand how this fits. And so, one of the things that we would talk about is like, okay, well, how best do you communicate through social with outreach? So, what are the types of maybe structures that work best, whether it is an in mail, a message? You know, if you're looking to maybe get in with an influential community, how are you interacting with that community through social? And so just helping understand kind of what those types of best practices would be outside of our normal training. So that tends to work out well. We've also started implementing some benchmarks and gamification now that we've been in the program for a little bit longer. So we utilize benchmarks as far as SSI is concerned. We'll also look at... Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by benchmarks for SSI? Are you communicating across the entire team, what everyone's SSI is? 
Yes. Uh, and this is, we primarily start with our sales leaders and this is where I've, I've been conscious in getting our sales leaders involved. And so I provide a monthly update on when it comes to sales navigator users specifically, we do talk about, okay, what are those SSI scores for your team? We had sent benchmarks based on previous usage and asking our teams before they would have any kind of premium account to send in their SSI score. And that way we can establish kind of where they're at now and then look for kind of an average that we can help them get up to. And so we like to use that as kind of a a barometer, not necessarily saying that this is a measure of success that you have to get to this point to be a successful sales professional at the bank, but more that you are getting the most out of your social media activity if you can find this level of SSI score and activity along with what you potentially are seeing for a pipeline and uh, moving your sales along that process. And so I I just want to add here, in the event that the listener to this episode has not previously listened to my five-part podcast series with SAP. We talked about this topic in that five-part series because one of the things that SAP is doing, now they've trained 12,000 people across the world in social selling techniques and strategies. And they've determined, Jason, that the salespeople at SAP that have higher SSI scores, north of 50, and the higher the SSI score, the better their sales results, the more, the bigger deals that they're bringing in their pipeline and the better conversion rates they're having. So basically, Mm -hmm. the highest performing sales reps also have the higher social selling index scores. Yeah. And I love that story because that's what we're striving to get to is to be able to showcase that. We are at a point where we're seeing we can establish that average. And actually our benchmark is also 50. And I think that's great to kind of be able to mirror and show that we also have something similar in, in such a great organization as a sales organization as SP is. And so we like to utilize that again, as that average, as that benchmark to make sure that we can help our laggards approach that area and try to exceed that. And then also being able to then work with some of our leaders. And I think one story that I absolutely love from our work this past year was I had a new commercial banker join our program at, I think it was around this time last year in 2017. And he was new to the bank in the middle of 2016. And we were able to get him in on our kind of expanded program utilizing Sales Navigator and LinkedIn as a regular basis. and. He, in his first year, full year as a sales professional at the bank, was able to make club. So for all, again, it may be a different name for each organization. Um, We call it Legends of Possible, but it's something that he was able to execute in his first full year at the bank. And I feel really, really proud because he flat out reached out to me and said, yeah, I don't think I would have been able to execute this without your training and having a better understanding of how to use LinkedIn. So I think that resonates really, really well now. And now we're looking at sharing that story along with some of our other wins this past year as another way to help keep our sales teams engaged and execute through social. Fantastic. Great story. Love that. So I think there's one more point I want to cover and then we'll get into my summary and wrap up the episode. I know that one of the things that we talked about in preparing for the conversation was the need to be transparent about all the marketing activities that you've got going on. And of course, marketing and sales alignment is one of the things that Jason, you and I realized we have in common probably within the first five seconds of our first conversation. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So if you want to speak to that and how you allow for that transparency of marketing strategy for your sales teams. Yeah. And this is the part where I feel we can do even better because our B2B groups have a good understanding of social, but we're not executing a lot of marketing campaigns as it pertains to social yet. And so we are establishing some of those processes. And I think where our social sales programs come into play and where I see a lot of engagement from our sales teams is when they know that if there's a certain trade show event or even just a marketing campaign around certain messages that we're putting to market that are specific to their business line, they tend to come in ready to roll, ready to talk about how they can execute this, how they can have and start conversations with their clients and prospects. And so I feel the transparency of what our marketing strategy is, as well as when we're actually executing campaigns helps activate our sales teams. And so that's where something I'm trying to bring in more consistently to our conversations, to our sales groups, 
to our business lines that we're working with consistently. And again, it may be something as simple as we have a handful of our reps going to a trade show and okay, how do we activate them to reach out to attendees and potentially schedule time to meet with them during the trade show? before they go to the trade show and then, you know, hoping to try to meet people that they can have conversations with maybe after the fact. I think you can be much more efficient with that type of approach. And then how do you then continue that conversation? And that's where then, let's say US Bank does have somebody speaking at that trade show. We'll look at that leader that is maybe presenting and look at having them write a synopsis of what they're speaking about on their LinkedIn profile as part of the publisher. That would then allow us to maybe have those discussion points before the meeting and say, hey, this is some of the things our U.S. Bank representative is going to be talking about at the trade show. Would love for you to check it out. And you then can ask any questions you may have after the fact where I can help you out with some of those pieces. So I think those are types of the things that we're looking at establishing. We've done a handful of those with some of our strategic business lines so far, but I'm looking to make a consistent practice. And I think, as I had mentioned, it helps our sales teams be way more engaged in these types of programs when they know they have something they can tactically execute. Exactly, exactly. And of course, anybody that's been with me on this podcast for any period of time knows that we talk about marketing and sales alignment quite a bit. And in fact, when we met in San Diego, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you attended the session that I led a panel discussion on employee engagement in one of my Mm -hmm. panelists was Karen Avilas with Centrica Business Solutions. And she was back on this podcast, back on episode 185. And she actually tells a similar story, Jason, where they had a a war room and they got people involved to promote activities that were taking place at a conference, at a a trade show that they were exhibiting at. So while it's not exactly apples to apples, nonetheless, the common denominator is, you know, the communication and the integration of marketing campaigns, marketing events and activities, and pulling salespeople in so that they're aware of it, and then arming them with the information, the mm-hmm. skills, the know-how, and even the opportunity to engage. So that's fantastic. Yeah, we try our best to make that available as much as possible. And again, it's best, I find it best when it's strategic and tactical for their specific business line. But we also provide branded content to help establish them as thought leaders within the banking industry and position US Bank. And so we do utilize an employee advocacy tool for some of our employees. We also have our internal intranet where we're curating content that is owned and third-party content so that the people that have gone through these best practices as far as sales teams, they can go to their sales resource center, find content that's curated for them. And it makes it much more easier for them to be active on social, to have conversations, to find content that they can share with their clients and prospects on a regular. Fantastic. All right, Jason, we are at a point in the podcast where I am going to recap the high points of what we discussed, and then I'm going to ask you to either fill in any holes or elaborate on a point briefly, and then we'll bring this episode to a wrap. We began our conversation with an introduction to your role at U.S. Bank and how you've been there for a couple years now, and you come from the agency world where you've got a strong background in working with LinkedIn and social sales, and how your focus there is to lead the social sales program across the B2B business lines, and you're very focused on marketing and sales alignment, as we just finished discussing, and how the fact that you're also you're part of the brand team, and I think that's terrific, where you're really understanding all aspects of the brand, including issues around compliance, so that you can really deliver a consistent voice across all the business lines. Now, it is, you are B2B focused, so B2B in your world is working with small, mid-sized, and even large businesses across a variety of financial needs, ranging from real estate investments, trust, custodies, et cetera, et cetera, and how the salespeople at U.S. Bank are largely relationship managers. You also have sales support people, but largely relationship managers who are really advocating for your client and really building strong relationships to be the trusted choice for their financial needs. So in your social sales program, we talked about kind of the 80-20 rule where you're really providing them with a lot of training and compliance and helping them understand how to use LinkedIn for prospecting and identifying triggers to start conversations and really how to use social 
for context when they're doing any kind of outreach, but then you've got sort of a 20% factor of customizing things that can help them foster relationships at the local level and establish themselves as thought leaders and Mm -hmm. providing content to them so that they can help their clients make introductions into other businesses and really get themselves to be part of the community that they're serving, really building a very strong network within the community that they're serving with a focus on what's the next best action that we can deliver to this client, even if it's not necessarily expanding our business with them, as you said, but really expanding the relationship with them. And that leads me to your strong point of how it's really a relationship first mentality, each person building themselves as a trusted source of information and a trusted source of financial offerings. And then again, what's the next best action in that relationship? You told the story about how your CIO was delivering a keynote at Dreamforce, which is Salesforce's huge, humongous annual conference, and how you're using Salesforce Einstein, which of course has AI built into it. So it's enabling you to really understand how clients are currently using US Bank and providing insights into, again, you know, how you can strengthen the relationship and what are the potential next steps in that relationship. And then we talked about how you keep the sales team engaged. You hold town halls with LinkedIn reps and super users of LinkedIn and occasionally even outside sales leaders and really provide insights into how they can best engage with social. You're implementing benchmarks, including social selling index, SSI, with a benchmark of you know 50 or higher providing monthly updates and really just encouraging people to do the activities that can help them improve their SSI score, which also has a correlation to improving relationships and outcomes. And you have a story that you like to tell about a new commercial banker that joined your bank back in 2016. They came into the program, went through the program, and in his first full year made club and how that's just a great success story. And then we kind of wrapped it up by bringing it back to my favorite topic, marketing and sales alignment, and how you're really establishing the B2B groups to engage in the marketing campaigns by communicating to them everything that you're doing from a marketing standpoint so that they know how to engage, how to, for example, access content, share that content, and you're providing them with tools and platforms to make that easy. You also recognize, Jason, that there's room for improvement and join the club. Everybody's in that boat, but it sounds like you're doing terrific there already. And again, recognize you know, other things that you can be doing to continually improve on that marketing and sales alignment. So anything that you would like to add to my summary? Yeah, I think those are great synopsis. And, you know, the one thing I really wanted to emphasize too is just like you had mentioned in your last podcast uh, on a highlight was that salespeople don't like MQLs. They prefer to look through that relationship and really qualify it themselves or have that team qualify it. So while I do work in marketing and I try my best to provide the best leads possible from our inbound initiatives, this is a way for them to take ownership by having these sales programs for social in place. It's a way for them to take ownership of how they're qualifying their sales leads. So I think that was a really important thing that everything kind of really leads up to that. Excellent. Yeah. And to that point about MQLs versus qualified opportunities, in many cases, in that podcast episode with Diana Eddington Reed from Oracle, she talked about how they're building account relationships, Mm -hmm. not just a lead for an individual. So I think that's a compelling point because at the end of the day in B2B, we want accounts, we want clients. And of course, we're dealing with people, obviously, but a lead Mm -hmm. isn't just be an individual. It should be a lead into serving that account, in your case, Mm -hmm. serving a business. So that's a terrific point. Thank you for bringing that out. Jason, where would you like to send my listener to connect with you online and learn more about what you've got going on? Yeah, I live and breathe LinkedIn, so that would be the primary place to find me, but also fairly active on all other social platforms. So Twitter would definitely be uh, another opportunity to connect. And what's your Twitter handle? It is at J Shobes. And so uh, again, just <laughs> everyone know uh, nickname when I was growing up called me Shobes. So uh, that was the best way to go. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, my listener knows that that will be linked up in our show notes page at vengressa.com. So Jason, thank you so much for joining me here today on the Social Business Engine podcast and sharing your enterprise social sales story at US Bank. Thank you for having me. Well, I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Jason Schober social media campaign manager at U.S. Bank. This has been episode 203, titled Addressing Challenges and Changing Culture with Enterprise Social Sales Programs. 
So my one big takeaway that I want to share about my conversation with Jason is that social selling at any company, and in this case, a financial institution, U.S. Bank is a financial institution, of course, requires both culture change and process change. Now, Jason shared a lot about processes and even admitted that some of them have room for improvement, but he also shared how they're evolving and the recognition that culture plays a big part, a really big part in the success of their social sales program. So in other words, it's a combination of both that breeds social sales success. One without the other just won't work. So hey, what's your takeaway from my conversation with Jason Schober at US Bank? Leave your comments in the show notes at vengresso.com in the podcast area. Just find episode 203 and let me hear from you. All right, I want to let you know before we sign off that this episode is sponsored by SAP. Social Business Journal Volume 11 is a case study in savvy social selling the SAP way. This case study is available for download without a form to fill out. It's ungated. You just click on it and it opens up right in your browser. It's available at vengresso.com forward slash SAP. And of course, we will link that up in the show notes page at vengresso.com forward slash podcasts. And hey, while you're there, be sure if you're not already subscribed to get the Social Business Engine podcast delivered to your inbox each and every week, well, then get subscribed. And also, while you're there, subscribe to my partner's podcast, Selling with Social, hosted by Vengresso's CEO, Mario Martinez Jr. Well, hey, that is a wrap for episode 203. I want to thank my guest once again, Jason Schober social media campaign manager at U.S. Bank. This is Bernie Borges, CMO of Ingresso, signing off for now and wishing you continued success on your social business journey. Thank you for listening to the Social Business Engine podcast. Be sure to tune in again next week to reconnect with Bernie Borges for more insights, inspiration, and practical advice on social business. Visit socialbusinessengine.com to catch even more content on social strategy that will rock your business and your career. 